Good mornings. We'd like to welcome you to our Sunday morning worship service for April the 25th, 2021. And we're so glad to see you here in person. And for those of you tuning in at home, we're so glad that you are joined us that way also. A few announcements to make for this morning. Um, tonight we're having a special call business meeting. I believe it was announced Wednesday night in that service. We're announcing it tonight. I mean today in this service for a special call business meeting tonight, April the 25th in the Sunday night service. It will be immediately after the live broadcast. May the 9th is Mother's Day and baby dedication. If you have a child or a baby that you want to dedicate on May the 9th, please call the church office and let them know so they can arrange for that. May 16th will be our baccalaureate service for the class of 2021. I know we have several seniors that we'll be recognizing that morning. Um, if you are a senior high school graduate that we don't have your name, or if you are a college graduate and you want to be recognized in the service that morning, please let us know so we can get you uh, ready for that. Um, May the 19th, our senior adults are starting back their senior adult luncheon. So that will be in the Family Life Center, I believe at 11, is that right? 11 o'clock that morning. Um, Last Sunday, we announced that we were that we were done with Annie Armstrong. Well, we were not quite done with Annie Armstrong. We lacked fifty dollars. So, sorry about that, y'all. But our Annie Armstrong offering is almost complete. We lacked fifty dollars for it to be complete. So, uh, I think today actually will be the last Sunday to give for that. If you want to give to your offering. Um, our offerings, if you want to um, mail it in to P.O. Box 205 here in Holka, you can do so. Our plates are at the back of the church and at the front of the church. And also, if you um, want to come by the church this week and drop offering off, you may do so. But always remember that we are, we are very um, open to, for you to give any way that you would like to do so. Another way that we're giving right now, we are always giving for our food pantry, and we are giving for the Operation Christmas Child Boxes, and I think every, every card was taken for the month of April, and those gifts are coming in the month of May. The um, Operation Christmas Child uh, Offering Boxes will be up again next Sunday, I believe, and I'm not sure what the offering is for the, for the month of May, but um, there will be an opportunity for you to purchase and give. And remember that you can also give a monetary gift. Let's bow for a word of prayer and begin our service. Dear Lord, we just love you so much. And we thank you that we are here this morning to worship you. And we just ask that you be with us as we worship you this morning in spirit and in truth. Open our hearts and open our minds to what you have to say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Our call to worship this morning is Jesus, what a friend for sinners.
continuing with our singing this morning. Be thou my vision. Be thou my vision, O Lord. This is Ezra chapter 7. Jesus, 
you've already found your way to Ezra chapter 7, as we are going to notice this morning in Ezra chapter 7, that God provides a guide. As you will notice also, this is the first time in the book of Ezra that we are actually introduced to Ezra. And in between Ezra chapter 6 and Ezra chapter 7 is about a 60 year time period where the book of Esther would have taken place. And now we see that Ezra is going to return to uh, Jerusalem with an assignment. And he is going to guide the people of Israel. He's going to show them some things. He's going to remind them of some things. But all of his uh, direction comes from God. What we're going to notice in Ezra chapter 7 this morning is that Israel was being reminded that God was the true king, and every day we need to be reminded, we need to remember and reflect on the fact that God is king, that he is king of kings, that he is lord of lords, that he is ruling, that he is reigning, that he is still in control, regardless of what may be going on in your life, regardless of what may be going on in our community or in our state or in our world, God is in control. And he is arranging events to fulfill his agenda. And so we're going to start out reading verses 6 through 10. I'm going to mention something about verses 1 through 5 in just a minute. But we'll start out in verse 6. This, this Ezra went up from Babylon, and he was a ready scribe in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given. And the king granted him all his requests, according to the hand of the Lord his God upon him. And there went up some of the children of Israel, and of the priests, and the Levites, and the singers, and the porters, and the Nethanims, unto Jerusalem in the seventh year of Artaxerxes the king. And he came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was in the seventh year of the king. For upon the first day of the first month began he to go up from Babylon, and on the first day of the fifth month came he to Jerusalem, according to the good hand of his God upon him. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it, and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you this morning. We are thankful for another opportunity that we have to gather together here as brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, we're thankful for your presence here this morning and the beautiful weather that we have here today. Lord, we pray that you would help us for just a few minutes to focus on your word, to be attentive to your Holy Spirit, and to be uh, receptive to the message this morning and to respond according to how we are led to respond. And Lord, we pray all these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, pointed all of this out and started out with verses 6 through 10 because what you'll see here is in the first 10 verses, it's the preparation for Ezra and others uh, from the area of Babylon and that region of Persia, all those other places to make their way back to Jerusalem. They were going to be going back. They were going to be making a journey. There was more that needed to go back. There was more to be done. At the end of Ezra chapter 6, we know the temple was rebuilt. There was the dedication ceremony. There was celebration. When you get to Ezra chapter 7, after that 60-year time period, what had happened was some of those that had gone back in that first wave of those who returned from exile had re-established the altar, they had rebuilt the temple, but those people, that generation had begun to die out and the younger generation needed a reminder. The younger generation needed to be stirred up, they needed to be uh, refreshed, they needed to be revived on what their purpose was, what God wanted to do with them there in the area where the temple was. And so that is why in verses 1 through 5, what you begin to see is that Ezra was of the line of Aaron. Those names may not have as much significance to us now, but certainly the names that were mentioned in verses 1 through 5 had significance to those who, were, who would read this letter, to those that Ezra was addressing this letter to. And it was showing that Ezra belongs to the 17th generation of the priestly line of Aaron. 
The idea here is it shows his background. It shows where he came from. It shows that there were people who had been a part of his life through the years that it, that he continued to teach him the word, who had continued to uh, teach him what the word meant, how to apply it to his life, how to apply it to the nation of Israel. And so that gives us the idea of his genealogy and what God was going going to do through him and who God was using. But what we also need to be reminded of this morning is not everybody may have the same heritage, may not have the same genealogy that Ezra did. But I want to challenge you this morning. I want to give you this this morning, this thought process, this idea that just because you may not be of the same genealogy or you may not have the same background that others may have does not mean that God cannot use you to make a difference, to make an impact, to turn your generation around. Because if we were to go through the sanctuary this morning, we all will have different testimonies. Some of us did come from a godly heritage. Some of us were uh, Baptist nine months before we were born. We've always been in church. Mom and Daddy brought us to church. We were always at revival meetings. We were always a part of vacation Bible school. As a matter of fact, we had a drug problem. We got drugged to church. That was our drug problem. Whether we wanted to come or not, we were there. And anytime the door opened, that's where we were going to be. Because Mom and Daddy took us to church, made sure that we there were there. For some, it may not have been a mother or a father. It may have been a grandfather or a grandmother. But whatever the case may be, we were there. Others may have not had that same heritage. It may have been later in life, whenever you were a teenager, or even after you were an adult, you made a decision to follow Christ. And you uh, now have the opportunity to teach your children, to train your children. And so the idea here is, is that we continue to train, that we continue to grow, that we continue to progress, that we continue to move forward. And whatever background we may be from is not an excuse because we do believe that God is mighty, right? That God is powerful. Do you believe that God is mighty? Do you believe that God is powerful? Do you believe that He is still saving souls? Do you believe that He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last? Do you believe all of these things that we have been taught in Scripture about how mighty and awesome and powerful that He is? If we believe that He is mighty, if we believe that He is big, if we believe that He is powerful, if we believe that He is omniscient and omnipotent and all of these things that we talk about, then certainly we ought to be able to believe that He can change your life and begin to make an impact through you for the next generation. That's what we see with Ezra, was that God would use him to make an impact on this generation that would have far-reaching effects for future generations. We can be thankful throughout Scripture that there were always those who remained faithful, that God always had that remnant of people that he could use to make a difference, to make an impact, to shape the society and world that they were in. And so regardless of whether you may have come from a priestly line, a godly line, or regardless of whether it, the godly line started with you and your generation, we need to be thankful that God is still working. We need to be thankful that God is still moving. And we need to understand that God wants to use us and can use us to continue to make an impact, to make a difference, because we can shine that light. We can be that city set upon a hill that must not be hidden. And so we notice his godly heritage. We notice, notice his background in their, those first five verses with the names that were mentioned there. When you get to verses 6 through 10, you begin to notice that he had a dedication, he had a devotion to the law of the Lord. And he went up from Babylon. He got permission to go up from Babylon. And he was given the opportunity. He was given the assignment. He was given the directive to go back and to teach the law of Moses. Because not only did you have a generation that died out, but you had this generation now in Jerusalem who wouldn't have been as familiar with the law of Moses. 
And that had to do with the fact that not everyone could read. Literacy was, a, was, not a, was an issue there, whether they could read or not. Whether they could read all of the scrolls, whether they could understand what they were reading. And so these scribes like Ezra would not only write the law, but they would explain the law. They would teach the law and they would show the people how it applied to them. And it was necessary for Ezra to go back because what you'll notice in the nation of Israel is that they may have left Babylon to go back home, but there was still plenty of Babylon in them that needed to be worked out, that God needed to move out. And so that is why it was important for them to understand the law of Moses, to get the law of Moses, to hear the law of Moses taught and read and what you'll notice about Ezra, it says that he was a ready scribe in the law of Moses. This morning, that is the thing that we need to examine as Christians today. Are we well educated in the Bible? We should be. We shouldn't just leave it up to the theologians to know what the Bible says. We shouldn't just leave it up to the pastors to know what the Bible says. We shouldn't just leave it up to the Sunday school teachers to know what the Bible says. But what we have to understand as we're coming up on Mother's Day and Father's Day is it is the family's responsibility to enforce and reinforce and reiterate what the kids, what the children are getting from the Sunday school lessons, from the sermons, so that they can apply it in their lives every day. And so that is why it's important as the family unit for you to have that time where you spend time in the Word during the week, where the Father is spending time in the Word, praying over the Word, and listening to God, where the Mother is reading the Word, praying over the Word, and listening to what the Lord is saying to them through the Word. And families come together, much like is talked about in the Shema in Deuteronomy chapter 6, where it is talked about when you rise up in the morning and as you go throughout the day. And so there are always opportunities for us to teach. There is always opportunities for us to learn lessons that come from the Word of God as we face different life situations each day. And so it is important that we have spent time in the Word. Why? Because God always has something to tell us and something to say to us each day as we read His Word and pray over it. We have to remember that it is as if He is still speaking fresh from His lips each time that we open the Word of God and read the Word of God and study and meditate upon the Word of God. What we need to remember is what Paul told Timothy. Paul told Timothy to study, to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Why is it that we have so much misinformation out there uh, about the Bible and about God's word and about what we're supposed to be doing as Christians and our responsibilities and all of the different things that are laid out there for us as Christians? It is because we have not been rightly dividing the word of truth and we are not working toward dividing the word of truth rightly. Too many times we want the Bible to say what we want it to say so that we can feel good about what we're doing, and that is dangerous. We have to follow the whole counsel of the Word of God. And so what you see here is that Ezra was going back so that he could lead the nation of Israel in understanding the law of Moses so that they could live according to the law of Moses so that they could be that set-apart, holy, peculiar nation that they had been called out to be. And we as Christians have been called out to be a peculiar people, to be a holy people, to be a set-apart people. We are not to blend in. We are to stand out. We are to be light in the darkness. I, <clears throat> I love uh, uh, something that I, I heard the other morning. Richard and I and Randy Horton were walking together, and Randy was talking about a race he did at night one time, or early one morning, and he said that there were runners out there that had lights on a, a, a cap or something like that where they could see where they were running. There's darkness all around us. The only reason that people can see how they're supposed to live 
and how we are supposed to be conducting ourselves is because we are the light in the darkness. And if we've hidden our light, then that makes it even more dark. And so what we have to understand is that we are to be the light in the darkness. We are to be ready to give a, a, a defense of what we believe and why we believe in it. And so that is why it's an importance for us and significant for us to know the Word of God. And it says there, not only was he already scribing the law of Moses in verse 6, but it says, which the Lord God of Israel had given. He wasn't reading from some other law. He wasn't teaching some other doctrine. He was teaching what the Lord God of Israel had given. So what we can be thankful for this morning is that we do have the whole counsel of the Word of God. We have Bibles that we can open up and that we can read from and that we can study from and that we can hear sermons from and we can read devotionals from that will help us to grow, that will help us to mature, that will help us to progress. And as we continue to read it, study it, meditate upon it, it is still speaking to us. And it says the king granted him, talking about Ezra, all his requests according to the hand of the Lord his God upon him. And that is significant when we think about the title of the sermon, God Provides a Guide. You can underline or circle or highlight that if you choose to do so. According to the hand of the Lord his God being upon him. We can be thankful today that not only were there men like Ezra, but we also know about Nehemiah and other inscriptions, but we can be thankful for men of God, that the hand of God was upon them, who have been faithful pastors in this pulpit. We can be thankful for men and women who have been faithful Sunday school teachers and leaders in the past in this church. And it is time for us who are here now to understand that we are here for a reason, that we are here for a purpose, that we are here for such a time as this, and God can use us, and God does want to use us to make an impact and a difference on those who are inside this sanctuary, but also on those who are outside the walls of these sanctuary who do not know Jesus. We still must be preaching the message. We still must be teaching the message that Jesus saves. We must be telling people about Calvary. We must be telling people about what Jesus did for us and how he died and rose again so that we could live victoriously and for eternity with him in heaven. It says in verse 7, And there went in went up some of the children of Israel and of the priests and of the Levites and the singers and the porters and the Nethanims unto Jerusalem in the seventh year of Artaxerxes the king. And so not only does Ezra go back, but there were others who rallied behind him who were willing to go, who no longer just wanted to sit on the sideline, but wanted to be in the fight, wanted to be in the battle, were willing to be spiritual warriors who were willing to count, they had counted the cost and they were willing to sacrifice whatever they needed to sacrifice to go back to Israel. What are we going to be willing to sacrifice for God to use us? What are we going to be willing to sacrifice for God to do a work in our life of reviving our hearts, of refreshing our hearts, so that we can be used of Him, so that we can make a difference, so that we can make an impact. Because Ezra was willing to sacrifice. These other people were willing to sacrifice, and they were willing to make a hard journey from Babylon back to Israel so that others could hear the word of the Lord. How much time are we going to be willing to give up out of our schedule so that others can hear the word of the Lord? So that they can be impacted by spending time in the presence of God. We're thankful for the volunteers who help out on Wednesday night with the youth and the children sacrificing some of their midweek time so that children can get lessons from the word of God. And we're thankful for our Sunday school teachers who spend time during the week 
studying and preparing to teach those lessons so that we can continue to grow and mature in our fellowship. But there is still much to be done and there's more that can be sacrificed and there's more that God wants to do and can do in our congregation, in our church, in our community. But it's going to take sacrifice on our part. It's going to take effort on our part. If we truly want to experience revival, if we truly want to experience growth spiritually, then we have to invest the time. We have to make the sacrifices. We have to be willing to set aside some things. We have to be willing to clear out our schedules so that God can work, so that God can move. But the problem is not that we don't want God to work. Not that we don't want God to move, but we want Him to move on our timetable and in the way we want Him to move, and that's not how it works. That's not how it works. These men and women were willing to go back. They were willing to sacrifice. They were willing to put forth the effort. They were willing to go the distance so that God could do a work in Israel. And it says in verse 8, And he came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was in the seventh year of the king. For upon the first day of the first month began he to go up from Babylon. And on the first day of the fifth month came he to Jerusalem, according to, there's this phrase again, the good hand of his God upon him. We should be thankful every day that his hand is upon us that He is guiding us, that He is willing to lead us, that He has provided His Holy Spirit that will guide us into all truth, that helps us to grow, that helps us to mature, that helps us to progress in our walk as Christians. And notice verse 10. This is the key verse in this chapter. For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord. How much time do we spend before we get into the Word of God, uh, the Word of God, preparing our hearts to seek the law of the Lord? How often do we simply open up the Bible and we read however many verses we read, just so we can say we read those verses that was a part of our daily Bible reading plan, or whatever it is that we're doing, or why ever it is that we're doing it? Ezra spent time preparing his heart to seek the law of the Lord. He was praying and preparing his heart to study the law of the Lord. Now here's something else that we begin to see as we continue to progress and look at this verse. Because he was well versed in the law of Moses. It meant that he had studied it. He understood it. He grasped it. It was a part of who he was. But that's not all that he did, is it? What we have to understand is that this Bible that we have is much more than a textbook or a history book or a poetic book or whatever it is that we could use it for or use it as, but it has truth, it has integrity, it shows us how to live, it shows us why we've been placed here, it reveals to us sin in our lives that needs to be confessed so that we can progress, so that we can grow, so that we can mature, so that we can make an impact and a difference. And what you'll notice here is not only had Ezra prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord, but notice what comes after the comma. And to do it. And I say to you this morning that not only do we need to have a knowledge of the Word of God, a head knowledge of the Word of God, but it needs to transform us it needs to mold us. It needs to shape us. And we not only need to know it, but we need to then do it. Put it into practice. That's what our children need to see. That's what our grandchildren need to see. It's what these people in this community need to see. Is not only do the members of Hawke First Baptist Church know the Word of God, but they practice the Word of God. They do it. They teaching also in Israel. He, he taught it. He taught Israel the statutes and the judgments because they had blended in with the nations around them. They had forgotten the covenant they had made with God. And so he was going to have to teach them what God had prepared him to teach. What God had sent him to teach. 
It wasn't going to be easy. It wasn't going to be pleasant to hear sometimes in the nation of Israel. But it was what he had been sent to do. It was because of Ezra's commitment to study and obey the law, to do it, and to teach it, that we see the Lord blessed him and blessed his ministry. Fathers, we need to understand our responsibility this morning is that we are the high priest of our household. And if we truly want to be blessed as a household, then we as men need to study the Word of God, prepare our hearts to seek the law of the Lord, to do it, and to teach our children the importance of it also. Because ultimately, whenever we begin to think about revival, if we won't, truly want revival, if we truly want refreshing in our church, it starts in the home. It will start in our homes. With fathers who are committed to the Word of God, to reading the Word of God, studying and praying and meditating upon the Word of God, putting it into practice and teaching. It will take families being committed to sacrifice time, to spend time preparing their hearts to seek the law of the Lord, to do it, and to teach it. That's what we need to see in our world today. That's what we need to see in our society today. So not only in verses 1 through 10 do we see the preparation, but very quickly in verses 11 through 28, we see the cooperation. The king gives an edict concerning Ezra and his return in verses 11 through 24. In verses 11 through 20, we notice that King Artaxerxes of Persia, or Ahasuerus, as he's mentioned in some translations, allows Ezra to return to Jerusalem, and he promises him the following things. In verse 13, he would say any Jews who wish to go with him can return. In verses 11 to 12, you begin to see the copy of the letter and who he gave it to and all those things. And in verse 13, he said, I make a decree that all they of the people of Israel, of his priests and Levites in my realm, which are minded of their own free will to go up to Jerusalem, go with thee. There was no limit to who could return. We know that there would be some that would remain in Babylon for various reasons. But all those who did go back with Ezra were committed. They made a commitment to go. They made a commitment to serve. They made a commitment to be active in what was going to take place. And then not only that, but the king said in verses 14 through 20, any finances that Ezra needed would be provided. He said, for as much as thou art sent of the king, and of his seven counselors to inquire concerning Judah and Jerusalem according to the law of thy God which is in thine hand and to carry the silver and gold which the king and his counselors have freely offered unto the God of Israel whose habitation is in Jerusalem and all the silver and gold that thou can find in the province of Babylon with the free will offering of the people and of the priests offering willingly for the house of their God which is in Jerusalem that thou mayest buy speedily with this money bullocks, rams, lambs with their meat offerings and their drink offerings, and offer them upon the altar of the house of your God, which is in Jerusalem. And whatsoever shall seem good to thee and to thy brethren, do with the rest of the silver and the gold that do after the will of your God. Now, while the king may not have himself been a believer in Yahweh, he was respecting the fact that Ezra and these people were wanting to follow the will of Yahweh and provided anything that they would need to reestablish sacrifices and all of the things that go along with what was going to take place when this group of people made their return. And any time you will notice here with any of these kings we've talked about so far, when they provide these things and they talk about your God, many times they'll ask for prayer uh, from uh, the people 
to Yahweh for them. Certainly they were wanting the blessings. They were wanting to experience uh, protection possibly and things like that. Regardless of what his motive was, God used this for the nation of Israel to be able to return with a second group and for Ezra to lead what would turn into a revival in the nation of Israel. In verses 21 through 24, we notice that the king commands his officials west of the Euphrates to also help supply needed items. He says in those verses, And I, even I, Artaxerxes the king, do make a decree, beginning in verse 21 there, to all the treasures which are beyond the river, that whatsoever Ezra the priest, the scribe of the law of the God of heaven, shall require of you, it be done speedily, unto a hundred talents of silver, to a hundred measures of wheat, a hundred baths of wine, to a hundred baths of oil and salt, without prescribing how much. Whatsoever is commanded by the God of heaven, let it diligent, diligently be done for the house of the God of heaven. For why should there be wrath against the realm of the king and his sons? In other words, he said, whatever you need, you make sure that you get it and we'll pay for it and we'll provide it because we don't want the hand of God being upon us in a wrathful way. <laughs> we, we don't want any wars coming upon us. We don't want any destruction and devastation coming upon us because we've held you back or hindered you in some way. So whatever you need, you've got it. You just go back and do what the Lord is leading you to do. And that leads to Ezra telling us the task, telling the people the task that he had been given, and also leads to praise and thanksgiving. In verses 25 and 26, it says, Ezra, after the wisdom of thy God that is in thine hand, set magistrates and judges, which may judge all the people that are beyond the river, all such as know the laws of thy God, and teach them that know them not. And so Ezra is given the ability by the king to not only judge and rule over the Israelites, but anybody else that was there so that they could know the laws of God, so that they could uh, follow those laws. And then in verse 26, And whosoever will not do the law of thy God and the law of the king, let judgment be executed speedily upon him, whether it be unto death or to banishment or to confiscation of goods or to imprisonment. And so even outsiders who may have been a part of this group that was there uh, would be under the law of God and would be under the mandates, the statutes that would be given and could be facing judgment just like the Israelites did. Certainly in that what we are under today, we were dead in our trespasses and sin. If we had not surrendered our lives to Jesus Christ, we would be facing eternal punishment in judgment. And that is what we need to understand today. That's why we need to have a heart for the lost people around us is because they are facing judgment. If they die without knowing Jesus Christ as their Savior, they will hear, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, for I never knew you. And they will be cast into hell for all eternity, which is a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. It is a place where you feel like worms are constantly eating at your flesh. It's like a bottomless pit that you never hit bottom. It's dark. There is no grace. There is no mercy. There is no peace. There is no love. And it will be that for all eternity. That is why we should be concerned for them. And that is why we should be desiring to know what Ezra knew. So that we can not only apply it to our lives and do it so that others are discipled, but do it and teach it so that others may surrender their lives as well. In verses 27 and 28, Ezra offers up a word of thanksgiving. He said, Blessed be the Lord God of our fathers, which hath put such a thing as this in the king's heart, to beautify the house of the Lord which is in Jerusalem. And hath extended mercy unto me before the king and his counselors, and before all the king's mighty princes. And I was strengthened as the hand of the Lord my God was upon me. 
And I gathered together out of Israel chief men to go up with me. Much like Ezra was grateful and thankful and praised God for granting him uh, the king's favor. And he understood that the hand of God was upon him and God had provided for him and provided a guide for the nation of Israel by using Ezra. We can be thankful today that God has provided his Holy Spirit that guides us into all truth. We can be thankful today for men and women who taught us the word of God, who made sure that we were exposed to the gospel so that we could surrender our lives to Jesus Christ and become joint heirs with him and have his righteousness credited to us. And if they are still around and you can thank them today, thank those men, thank those women. Send them a card, send them a text, call them on the phone, whatever it is. Be thankful, be grateful, be appreciative for those who sacrificed their time, used the gift or gifts that they have been blessed with to invest in you so that you could grow, so that you could mature and come, become the individual you have become. And you now have the responsibility of investing in others, spending time pouring into others so that they can grow, so that they can mature, so that they can be disciples who make more disciples. As we close out this morning, Tony Evans says this, when you know God and experience his powerful work in your life, you will have the confidence and courage to fulfill the ministry he has given you. What ministry has God given you and are you surrendered to him totally so that he can use you to make an impact and a difference in the world around you? If you do not know Jesus as Savior and Lord of your life, you can know him today before you leave this place. Do not leave here if your heart is not right with God. As Miss Melinda comes, we'll pray and prepare for a time of invitation. Lord, we come to you this morning. We thank you for Ezra. We thank you for his devotion. We thank you for his dedication. Lord, we're thankful that in this process we see that your hand was upon him, that you were guiding his life. And Lord, we're thankful that you still guide our lives today through your Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that if there is someone here this morning who does not know you as Savior and Lord of their life, that they would surrender all before they leave this place today. Lord, we pray that you would help us to continue to invest in others. Teach them your word. Do what it is that you have placed us here to do so that we are disciples who are making more disciples. And we pray all these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. I ask you to stand, Ms. Melinda.